Well, let's go to my panel for tonight. Sky News contributor Kosha Garner, former Labor MP Michael Danby. Well, it's all about the White House race at the moment. New Hampshire's underway. We saw that route there for uh, uh, the former president, or currently president, we call him, don't we, Donald Trump, uh, in Iowa. What can we expect in New Hampshire? We're down to two. Haley's not in the running, but is she running for something else, do you think? Maybe. Trump has officially, well, nothing's ever official with him, but he has ruled her out as vice president, and yep. um, his supporters really, really dislike her, so it, it wouldn't make sense for him to pick her, but maybe he sees something we don't. Um, I, th I think you're right. This is a formality, cosmetic almost, until the inevitable, just given his showing in Iowa and the polling and all the rest of it. Um, maybe she wants to see it through to South Carolina, which comes next, and that's her home state. She's polling a little bit tighter to, to Trump, so maybe off the back of that momentum, there's something that comes with it, but I think this is all... Uh, just cosmetics. Is this about her setting herself up, though? If Trump was to run this time, does she set herself up for the next potential election? I think that's always a possibility, but as they say, a week is a lifetime in politics. <laughs> Four years from now, where is she? Where is Ron DeSantis? Who else is on the scene? Um, I really think this was kind of her one-shot moment. She is sort of propped up or supported by the donor class and a lot of other people like her, so this was her, her time, but I, I would think that she'd probably be obsolete uh, in 2028, but who knows? All right, Michael, assume we've got Trump. Do we have Biden as well? A lot of other people like her, a lot of people who uh, are you know, immigrants and people who are great people like Nikki Haley. So I, I wouldn't disparage her, but we've got Trump. And if it's a Biden-Trump um, uh, contest, as Nikki Haley says, 70% of Americans don't want that. 70%. And if the, de if the Democrats allow that to happen, um, they're giving Trump a victory. Trump will win mm. in a Biden-Trump uh, contest. Um, and I, I just... F think that that's crazy you know they surely yeah, so there must be a way of who do you think it could be uh, maybe the governor of california but um you know they, they're leaving it so late that some of the uh, wiser old people in the uh, democratic party james carville and, and axelrod are begging biden to step down I, I think the problem is the next year will be so serious in international affairs we have a person whose acuity is not able to deal with the situation yeah i think that's the real way who do you think it could be Gavin Newsom's name gets floated. Um, Michelle Obama is kind of the she keeps the coming wild card. She keeps coming back, and yeah. she would never do it. I think through the muddy process, but there is a little provision at the convention that you can parachute somebody in, uh -huh. and they don't have to go through the mudslinging of a primary process. And there are some who theorize that that's deliberate, why he's leaving it so late, but. Uh -huh. Who knows? I think these are all fantastical scenarios. Most likely it's going to be Biden. Hey, what about this court case you drew my attention to? This is uh, this could be a game changer for Trump. Yes, it um, angered a lot of people on the Republican side, including elected officials and others. So this was um, a dispute between the federal government and the state of Texas. You've been covering regularly the illegal immigration pouring through mm -hmm. the border, mm -hmm. 8 million people under Biden. The state of Texas, the governor started erecting a barrier, barbed wire, basically saying, if you won't do it, we will. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the federal government sued and, and presented an emergency case to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court sided with the Biden administration on the basis of jurisdiction and who owns that land where that barrier was erected. But politically, even if legally that's sound, maybe, um, politically, everybody can see what's happening with the border. It's a number two issue right now. Even Democrats are, have had enough of it. And there's a lot of momentum, I think, from this issue that comes in, which basically is suggesting the only person who can stem this is somebody in the executive branch who is tough on immigration, and that's what Trump is positioning. Plays into him perfectly. Yeah. Hey, I've got to ask you comments made by Tony Abbott today in the media to say we are not doing enough for Ukraine. We've let them down. We know we're going to bury these Taipan helicopters in the ground. I know you and I talked about this outside the studio last week. I mean, I think it's just horrific. Um, they asked for more Bushmasters. We didn't give them to them. We've got them sitting in garages in Queensland. But also they asked for coal, for God's sake, back in December. And we haven't even had the courtesy, Michael, at a federal government level, given your old party hates coal, to even respond to the request. What's going on? Well, General Mick Ryan, who is uh, a Liberal Australian military figure, says that there are 20 Taipans left. Now, I used to know Richard Miles well, and I appealed to him, Richard, you're a humanitarian. The Ukrainians are having mass casualties caused by the lack of ammunition. To, they need these helicopters for medevac. Yep. Um, for God's sake, um, you know, drop the pride of the Australian government. And you're the minister, you're the deputy prime minister. Tell the CDF and the D Defence Department, you know, I'm in charge. Send the bloody helicopters to the Ukrainians. They really need them.
And the coal too. How about and the coal? That? I mean, the, do we want the Ukrainians to freeze during the, uh, uh, with all of their electricity knocked out by, you know, Mr. Putin? It's crazy. Sure, we could afford some coal. Send a few ships, Richard. Hey, just quickly, um, Hamas, there's been this debate about the money, and we talked about it last week, you know, Penny Wong's given another 20-odd million, bringing it up to $46 million to the Palestinian cause. She says it's for humanitarian, then she has to appeal after she's given the money, don't you dare use it for terrorism. But you've done a bit of research about where the Hamas money is. Yeah, and it's really opaque. It's very difficult with any of these terrorist organizations, of course, to, to source and, and follow the money. Cryptocurrency is one. I think there were sanctions. This place, Australia joined the US and the UK. It's low-hanging fruit to yeah. sanction cryptocurrency funding Hamas, so they did that. I think it's about 40 to 45 million, is what analysts say, that they acquired through crypto in three years. So it's not that much. Um, a lot of it is through this cat and mouse game that NGOs and charitable organizations run, where there's a cover of something else, but they're sympathetic to Hamas, and then the Funding goes back, and certain countries maybe aren't as astute at figuring that out and, and penalizing them or criminalizing it. And then there are state actors, Iran, as we know, and the plane loads of cash that the U.S. Yeah, sent six, to six Iran. Billion. Yeah, six that comes billion. up. And Qatar is another one that there seems to be a lot of friendly people and leaders of Hamas um, that live in Qatar, and uh, Qatari's funding it. And that's a whole other can of worms because they are quite cozy as a lobbying group in a lot of Western governments right now. So there's a lot of um, questions, I think, that need to be asked about that. A lot of luxury living at the Four Seasons Hotel in Doha. Yeah. And a lot of the worst are already out of the country, aren't they? Yeah. All right, Michael Danby, Koshigata, great to have your company.